Thank you for tuning in. We at Greater New Point pray that your experience with us today is blessed and helpful. For more information about our ministry, please visit us at greaternp.org. Let's listen in. Good morning, Greater. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I am excited that the Lord has blessed us to see another day, another year. We are in the year of 2022. Some didn't make it, but thank God that we are here to witness another year. God has been faithful. God has been good unto us and we thank him for his grace and we thank him for his mercy let's open up with our scripture reading for the, this morning our scripture reading for this morning our morning worship will come from psalm 24 this is a psalm of david david says there the earth is the lord's and all of its fullness the world and those who dwell therein for he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. David asks, he says, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? For who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord righteousness from the God of our salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? Great question. David answers it and said, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Lift up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. David reiterates it again and asks the same question, Who is this King of glory? And he answers and said, The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. And that he is. He is the King of glory. He is the Lord God or my almighty and thank God that he is our father thank God that he is the sovereign one thank God that through Jesus Christ we have a relationship with the almighty sovereign God let's look to the throne of grace oh God we thank you again for blessing us to see a new year let alone, thought God, thank you for blessing us to see a new day. It was because of your grace and your mercy, God, that has allowed us to be able to see this day. Thank you, God, for keeping us as we slept all night long. We were unconscious, God, and so many things that happened around us. Thank God that it didn't happen to us. But we thank you, God that last night was not our last night here on earth. Now, God, as we continue in our worship on today, we pray, God, that although we are not worshiping together physically in a building, God, but as your church, we are worshiping together virtually. Be amongst us now, Holy Spirit. Bounce from across this broadcast. And we pray, God, that your Holy Spirit's presence is felt, seen, and heard in evidence, God, in all that we do on today. Bless our worship and keep us now. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let every heart shout amen, amen, and amen. Again, we are not worshiping together physically because of COVID and the heightened state of COVID. COVID has uh, uh, ravished our nation and our country and, and our world uh, more so all, all over, but we were not able to worship uh, together in, in person, but we are able to worship virtually. And regardless if we are worshiping virtually or physically, that does not negate our responsibility to give God praise, to worship him for who he really is. Amen. I want us to prepare now to uh, tune in for a few announcements and then we will
go from there. May God bless you. did you make it but as the songwriter said you made it out all right things may not be favorable as the way you want them to be your body may be racking with pain and COVID is running rampant but thank God that you made it to see another day you made it to see another day your family made it to see another day you know the hell that you went through in 2021 but god still loved you and blessed you to make it out all right hallelujah hallelujah thank you lord 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 because i am not a victim because of you i am now a victor thank you lord for blessing us and allowing us to make it out all right. 
All right. Amen. Amen. Thank God for that song. Amen. One of my favorite songs, as a matter of fact. Um, let's let's begin now and take a pause to worship the Lord in our giving. Worship the Lord in our giving. As I mentioned in the uh, video message that I sent out earlier this week, uh, although we are not worshiping uh, in person, and we're worshiping virtually that does not negate our responsibility to be a faithful steward over our treasures over what the Lord has placed into our possessions amen God has been blessing us amen God has been blessing us and keeping us and keeping you uh, I can give my own uh, testimony that the Lord I times we just didn't know how we were going to make but the Lord has been blessing us and keeping us amen we ought to be able to bless God and give back unto him out of acts of sacrifice and acts of obedience so listen let's pause right now wherever you are if you have not dropped off your tithes and offering to the church on the screen you will see there are uh, ways to give digitally. We can give directly through Givelify, uh, but the best way to do it is to go to our website. That's greater N P G R E A T E R N as in new P as in point dot org. Greater N P dot org. Click the Give Here tab, and you'll be able to give your tithes and your offering directly to the church. Amen. Amen. If you are not able to give digitally, we're asking that you can drop your tithes and offering off or mail it directly to the church to 60 Payne Avenue, Irvington, New Jersey, 07111. Amen. Let's prepare our hearts and minds for the word of the Lord, the first message of this year. I'm excited to preach to you. Let's prepare our hearts and minds to hear what the Lord has to say through by what he has already said in his written word. Let's listen in. Oh God, now it's time for us to hear your word. Please now speak a word into our life that will help set the foundation for this year. Guide us now and let us be governed by what you say through by your word. Give me now your presence and your power to stand and preach the truths of Jesus Christ. I pray God that someone who do not know Christ as their savior today may come into a saving faith with our Lord and savior Jesus Christ. Lord, allow your word to fall on good ground and soak into the hearts and minds of your people to produce the fruits of your spirit. Holy Spirit, now have your way during this moment. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will allow your people to receive your word and allow me to stand and declare your word with power, truth, and persuasion. I commit this as an act of worship unto thee. So now let the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you are a strength and redeemer. And all of God's children said, Amen. Our text for today will come from Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 7. And we want to begin at verse 24 and conclude at verse 27. Matthew chapter 7 beginning at verse 24 and concluding at verse 27 I am reading from the New King James Version of the Bible therein the reading is this therefore whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. 
But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. Amen. The word of the Lord is blessed. Amen. We pray that the Lord will be pleased. Amen. With what we declare on today. Today, I want to tag this text uh building the best way to build your life the best way to build your life amen and i desire your prayers in the year uh 1845 actually in may 1845 two royal naval ships the HMS Terror and the HMS Erebus embarked from London on a voyage with ambitious, ambitious aim. The mission would forge a passage through the partially mapped channels of Northern Canada and pioneer the Northwest Passage. In the process, the mission would also open new trading routes and allow vessels to forego the dangerous and lengthy passage around Cape Horn. This voyage led by uh, Arctic veteran, Sir John Franklin, the ship was equipped with new technology pioneered in Britain. The new technology church was coal-fired engines, powering propellers, screws for locomotion and tinned food. This was a, it was a risky trip. Hostile conditions, the use of new technology and operating beyond the reach of immediate rescue parties meant that the expedition was the equivalent of a Victorian era moon landing. <laughs> if men, supplies, technology, know-how, or even leadership failed, then death could be and would be expected. But if the ship had been properly equipped with the right resources and decisive leadership, it would succeed at its voyage. In July, 1845, the ships sailed out of Baffin Bay and it was never heard from again. After two years of silence, the alarm was raised in Britain and rescue ships were dispatched. The rescue mission brought back the tragic news that 129 men had died in the greatest single disaster in Arctic exploration. A rough outline then became clear. All had started well, but the ships had been poorly equipped from the very beginning. The engines were underpowered and much of the tinned food that was on board that was produced by a contractor who was the lowest bidder in turn gave the men food that was already rotten from the very beginning. Franklin's ill-equipped ships became prey to tidal movements in ice, leaving men dangerously short of supplies. Someone on the ship had left a short note stating that Franklin was dead and survivors were abandoning the ships to head south with rowing boats. Eventually, one of those rowing boats were, was discovered, but it was discovered with the skeletons of the men 
still on the inside. This story, church, illustrates for us the importance of building on the right foundation. Hear me, if you if your start is faulty, then your ending will be disastrous. Let me say that again. If your start is faulty, then your ending will be disastrous. And as we begin this new year, I think it's important for us to ensure to ensure that we don't build our hopes of making personal behavioral changes because 2022 has arrived. We cannot build our life on resolutions and finances and people and other things that can and will let you down at some point. The only way to make sure that your life is grounded and that it will stand the test of times is to ensure that your hope, your trust, and your life is built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. This, beloved, is what Jesus is illustrating for us here in our text. Jesus here in Matthew chapter 7 verses 24 and beyond is concluding the Sermon on the Mount. And as he closes the Sermon on the Mount, watch, he gives a warning in regards to hearing the word of God and obeying the word of God. Let me say that again. As Jesus begins to close out his Sermon on the Mount, he gives a warning in regards to hearing the word of God and obeying the word of God. Amen. The theme of the Sermon on the Mount, I believe, is really stated in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, where Jesus says, For I say unto you, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter into the kingdom of heaven. This declaration that Jesus gives here was absolutely shocking to the crowd that heard these words because to this particular crowd, no one could be more righteous and religious than a scribe and a Pharisee. I told you before that the word righteous or righteousness means being right in the sense of being fully justified. It comes from a root word that simply means a straight, uh, straightness. It refers to a state that conforms to an author authoritative standard. Well, what's the standard? What's the authoritative standard? Good question. The authoritative standard is and will always be the word of God. But the problem was that the scribes and Pharisees had lowered the standards of the law or lowered the standards of the word of God because they felt as though that trying to live up to the law was impossible. So they changed, I told you this before, they changed the word of God into man-made rules and began to teach what was called Pharisaism. Again, Pharisaism was a system that was devised to circumvent the requirements of the holiness of God and the demands of the law of Moses. And their systems taught that if people were able to live according to their interpretation of the law, then they would then be acceptable in the sight of God. But the problem every one of the commandments that they had set forth before men had everything to do with external conduct. They were only concerned with how they looked on the outside to other people, and they were not concerned about the reality of the inside, the reality of their darkened heart. And let me just footnote here by saying this, this is why I'm, I'm not so impressed 
with church folk, especially on Sunday mornings. Mm -mm, I, I'm not impressed because we we can dress up. We, we can put on our Sunday's best. We could wear our white on first Sundays. We we know when to lift our hands. We know when to shout hallelujah. We know when to say amen. We know when to look deep and dignified. But hear me, hear me. Anyone can put on a good act for an hour and a half on Sunday morning. Anyone can put on a costume and play the part for a few hours. It, it's not about what you have on and how you look and how dignified you can act in front of other people. But what it's really about is how you're living when you're when you're all by yourself. What you do when no one is watching what you do, when you when you take off your suit, you take off your Sunday hat and you take off your Sunday's best. When you put the word of God down and put down the hymnal, what does your life look like then? Hmm? Hear me. God does not care about what you look like on the outside. All he care about is, has there been a change, a radical, genuine change of who you are on the inside in and through the person of Jesus Christ? So I think the point that I'm pushing greater is simply this, this, don't get caught up in building your Christian life on a faulty foundation, but build your life by hearing and obeying the word of God. Amen. Amen. By obeying the word of God. So after explaining what true righteousness is all about, Jesus now ends the Sermon on the Mount by simply saying this, he says, if you missed my message, I want you to keep my story. If you missed my message, he says, I want you to keep my story. I heard the preacher retell this parable a different way. Uh, he says, two men were in line together, <laughs> waiting to receive their building permit. They were to each build themselves a new home. And as they talked to each other, they discovered that the plots of ground in which they were to build their houses were in fact close to each other. They, they realized that they were going to be neighbors. So they both started approximately at the same time building their new homes. One man, he showed up with all of the tools and equipment and resources that he needed to build his new house while the other man, he just showed up on his plot of land with just a shovel. <laughs> and as the man across the way started laying his foundation, the other man took his shovel and just started digging. The first man, after laying his foundation, he started putting up the frame to his house. But the other man just kept on digging. And after the man put the frame up to his house, the, the first man started, he, he put in wiring and plumbing and began to put up the walls and the roof to his house. But his neighbor, mm -hmm, he was still digging deeper and deeper into the hole he started digging. The man across the way started putting in appliances and furniture and, and started laying out his new home while the man with his shovel was still going deeper and deeper into the hole that he was digging. And one day his wife showed up with his daily lunch and said to him, baby, this, this is going to be my last time bringing you lunch. I, I, I just can't take it anymore. She, she said, this is absolutely embarrassing. That family across the way is about to have their housewarming party. And here it is that you are still digging down into that same hole. You've been digging into that same hole for months. And as she started walking away, her husband 
he hit something hard with his shovel and he shouted out to his wife. He said, wait a minute, baby. I think I found what I've been looking for. And having established the rock he was looking for, he then built his home. <laughs> Finally moving in, that same night a severe storm came through by where they lived. The rain fell, the water, the flood, water rose and the wind began to blow. And as all of that was going on on the outside, this man was able to sleep peacefully through it on the inside until his wife awoke him and called to him and said, baby, take a look out this window. That house across the way is toppling over and it's being carried away by the flood waters. The husband held his head up, nodded at his wife, and he slept his way through the storm. This beloved is the story of our text. It's a story that Jesus tells to warn us again as hearers, watch, to warn us that it is dangerous. It's dangerous to hear the word of God and don't obey what the word of God tells us to do. And I just want to say to you, church, if you want a life that is ready for whatever 2022 brings, be it good or bad, it is imperative that we hear and heed the message that Jesus gives in this text. Let's dive into the lesson. First, you must ensure that your foundation is sturdy. You must ensure that your foundation is sturdy. It's in the text, verses 24 to 27. The clear emphasis in the text is on obedience, on obedience. Now, that is not to suggest or to say that hearing is not important. I believe that hearing is very important. As a matter of fact, Paul says in Romans chapter 10, verses 14 and 15, he says, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they be sent? Verse 17 says, so then faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing the word of God. Hearing, beloved, is essential to both saving faith and Christian maturity. Let me say that again. Hearing is essential to both saving faith and Christian maturity. But we cannot stop at just hearing. Our hearing must be coupled. It must be married to obedience. James chapter one, verse 22 says, be doers of the word of God and not hearers only. Why? Because when we are become hearers and not doers, of the word of God, we are deceiving our own self. Watch, hearing the word of God creates an obligation for us to do what the word of God says to do. Let me say that again. Hearing the word of God creates an obligation for us to do what the word of God says for us to do. Phil Johnson says, the word of God well understood and religiously obeyed is the shortest route to spiritual perfection. He says, and we must not select a few favorite passages to the exclusion of others. I like this ending part, he says of his quote. He says, nothing less than a whole Bible can make a whole Christian. <laughs> Hear me church, every one of us who hears the word of God, who hears God's word is under an obligation to submit and to obey to what it says. Your salvation and my salvation obligates us to hear and heed the word of, you do know that it's not up to you to determine what part of the Bible that you decide to follow. 
if you have accepted Christ as your savior, hear me clear, you are obligated to follow and to obey the commands of God. And in this parable, Jesus describes the relationship between hearing the word of God and doing the word of God in terms of a wise man who built on the rock and a foolish man who built on sand. He says in verse 24 that those that hear my word and obey them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Jesus, in this verse, describes the life of one who is wise, who is wise. What does it mean to be wise? Or what does it mean to have godly wisdom? Godly wisdom. Godly wisdom, church, is living life in the light of the revelation of God's will and God's word. Hear me. Through by the Holy Spirit. And then applying this knowledge to my life. Let me say that again. Godly wisdom is living life in the light of the revelation of God's will and God's word through by the Holy Spirit and then applying this knowledge to my life. That's wisdom. That's wisdom. But also notice here that Jesus did not say anything about having knowledge. He didn't say anything about having knowledge. Having knowledge is not the same as being wise. It's not the same as being wise. Um, I don't know who, who said it. Uh, I read it somewhere. I don't recall, but someone has defined knowledge as the process of passing from the unconscious state of ignorance to the conscious state of ignorance. They concluded by saying, ignorance does not know that it does not know. <laughs> Spurgeon says, wisdom is the right of knowledge. He says, to know is to be wise. He says, many men know a great deal and are all the greater fools for it, but there is no fool so great a fool as a knowing fool. <laughs> but to know how to use knowledge is to have wisdom. And truthfully, church, honestly, if you think about it, anybody can acquire knowledge. But wisdom, godly wisdom, is knowing how to use the knowledge that you've acquired to glorify God. The scribes had knowledge. The Pharisees had knowledge. Judas had knowledge. The, the chief priests and elders had not. Both you and I have knowledge. But the real test of faith comes in when what you have acquired or what you know needs to be put into practice. True godly wisdom comes from obeying what God commands. And this is what Jesus is saying in this text. He's saying that if you want to build a life that is full of wisdom, he says, for us to build our life on the rock of his word that will last forever. The rock of his word. That This word rock, or the way the word rock is used here in the text, um, of course, relates to the passage at hand. But in a broader sense, it, 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 it applies to every recorded command or every recorded statement made by Jesus in the New Testament. And ultimately, hear me, ultimately, it applies to everything that's found in sacred scripture. Um, if, you, if, if, you, if you did not know, let me make you aware of it. Ready for it? All right. The Bible is a Jesus book. <laughs> the, the, the Bible is a Jesus book. It's about Jesus from Genesis all the way to Revelations. It's, it's, it's about Jesus from the beginning all the way to the end. Yeah, it is. It is. It is. Let me tell you why. The historical books of the Bible foreshadows Christ. The poetic books of the Bible anticipate Christ. But the prophetic books 
of the Bible, it foretells Christ. And then when you get to the New Testament of the Bible, the Gospels, it reports Christ. And then the epistles of the Bible, it explains Christ. And then when you finally get to the last book of the Bible in Revelations, hallelujah, it glorifies Christ. The Bible, beloved, it's all about Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. John chapter 5, verses 39 and, and verse 40, Jesus says, he says there, you search the scriptures because you think that in the scriptures you will find eternal life. But these are they that bear witness of me, but you refuse to come to me so that you may have eternal life. Hear me clearly, greater. You will not find life in the scriptures until you find the life giver in the scriptures. Jesus says you are a wise person if you build your life on the rock of his word. Amen. But then Jesus also says in verse 26 that those who hear his word and does not obey his word, watch, he says, it's like a man who builds his house on sand. Look, look at verse 26 and verse 27. It says there, but everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Verse 27 and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the wind blew, and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Look at the text. Two men build their house, houses on different foundations. And watch, the houses, when you look at it, the houses may even look similar, right? They may have been made from the same material. They may have cost the same amount of money. They may have been designed the same. They may have the same amount of bedrooms and they may have the same amount of bathrooms, but watch, Jesus says that there is something that's different about these two homes. You see it in the text? The difference is the foundation, the foundation. One is built on the rock while the other builds his house on sand. Now, tell me who in the world <laughs> would build a house on sand? Um, last summer, I, I went, I did a lot of fishing. And um, there are several places that I, I, I go to fish. Um, but there's one place in particular I go that has a beach area where most folk that are fishing uh, will congregate. It was spread out, but it would be a, we, we would all be on the beach. And as I stood on the beach and threw my water out and began to fish, as the water rolled in, so did the sand that was uh under my feet the, the the water pulled in and it pushed the sand right out and it pulled the sand right up under my feet and the sand watch the sand because it's being pulled out with the water it, it would not keep me balanced so periodically i would have to shift and move my feet in the sand to try to stand leveled. It, it, it would keep me unstable. It would, it, the sand would become unreliable. So let me raise the question that I just posed a second ago. Who in the world would build a house on shifting and unstable and unreliable sand? Jesus says, I'll answer that question for you. Let me tell you who would do that. Jesus says, a fool would do that. <laughs> and, and he further pushes the envelope by saying, if you do not obey my word, believers, 
child of God, you too are like a foolish man. And let me just throw this out there parenthetically. Jesus in this text, hear me, is not talking about irreligious people, but he's talking to people who think they are in the kingdom of heaven. He's talking to people that are churchgoers that come to church and hear the word. But he says that they, they are foolish because when they hear it, they don't obey it. So when Jesus speaks of wisdom and foolishness here, he is using it in the Old Testament sense of the term. It's not something intellectual that Jesus is describing here, church, but he is speaking of something that's that's moral and spiritual and ethical. As a matter of fact, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, it says there that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And he says, fools despise wisdom and instruction. So watch, that's scripture's description of the unbelieving world, right? Foolish people despise the wisdom and instructions of the world. As a matter of fact, the world is filled with people who foolishly believe that you don't have to have a foundation to build on. Right. And then there are those who feel like it doesn't even matter what foundation you build on. They, they just believe any foundation will will do. And, and truthfully, both viewpoints are absolutely wrong. And hear me. Some of you are wrong if you build your foundation on anything opposite than the word of God. Right. Some folk build their foundation on money and education in careers, in looks, in family, in ministries, or whatever your definition of success is, but every one of us is building on something. But here's the question that stands and yells out today. If what you are building is on something that is unstable, it will not last. And you have to ask yourself, will it endure? Will it be able to stand the test of time? And Jesus says that if you are building on shifting, unstable sand that's unreliable, that in what you are building will not last and it renders you a fool and everything that you try to build on it will fall. It will be a great fall. It, 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 it would be a fall that's so significant that it's something you can't hide. Everybody will see your fall. He says, don't, don't build on, on sand. Not only must I ensure that my foundation is sturdy, but secondly, I must understand that what I build at some point, it's going to be inspected. <laughs> Again, two men build houses on different foundations, one on the rock and one on sand. Um, the heart of the parable is the contrast between the two foundations, right? Rock versus sand. But while there's a contrast of the two foundations here in the text, Jesus also highlights the contrast by a parallel or similar experience in, in verses 25 and 27. Watch. It says there, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Here's the parallel, similar situation in the rain, verse 27, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, here's the difference, and it fell, and great was its fall. Watch. The first thing we need to understand about this inspection is that it's inevitable. It's going to happen. Again, two men build houses on two different foundations, one on rock, one on the sand, but the rain and the flood and the wind that came to beat on these houses, watch, it didn't just hit one house. 
but it rained on both houses. It rained on both houses. Pay attention because this is, this is very helpful. It's helpful to us uh, because it teaches us here that regardless if you are wise or foolish, regardless if you are righteous or wicked, regardless if you build your house on the rock or on the sand, the truth of the matter is you will go through storms. You will go through, listen, don't, don't get it twisted into thinking that just because you are saved, you are a church member and you are filled with the Holy Ghost that you will not go through some storms. Your faith in God your love for God, your hope in God, and your obedience to God does not eradicate the storms of life. Don't y'all believe these false preachers and false prophets, Peter Popoff and all these guys who says that your life as a child of God should be glorious and raining roses every day, and that as a Christian, you are exempt from the storms of life. If that's your thinking, let me be the first one to tell you the fact is you will have storms. Storms are part of your life. As a matter of fact, sometimes in life, you will face some storms as a direct result of your obedience to the Lord. I know that's true. I know that's right. As a matter of fact, I brought some scripture to back that up. Mark chapter 4, Jesus says to his disciples, he says, let us pass over to the other side. The disciples get into the ship, and as they begin to cross the Sea of Galilee, a storm breaks out. And it begins to toss the disciples back and forth to and fro on the ship. But here's my point that I'm pushing. They didn't get into a storm on the sea because they were being disobedient to the Lord. Mm -mm. But they found themselves in the middle of a storm just because they were being obedient to the Lord. And sometimes, church, being obedient to the Lord, it will take you directly into a storm. But when the Lord take you directly into a storm, it's not to hurt you, but it's to cause you to strengthen your faith muscle. And I don't know about you, church, but thank God that even in storms, when I'm in the storm, regardless if it's because of my neglect or disobedience or because of the Lord sending me in a storm, thank God that he is with us when we are in the storm. Amen. Look at the text. The text says that it rained, the wind blew, and the flood water came. Watch, let me read that again. The text says that it rained. The wind blew and the flood water came. I don't know about you, but that just seems to give a great description of life. It's, it's a great description of life because when you look at life, if it ain't one thing, it's another. Sometimes after the rain stopped falling in my life, the flood waters come. And just as soon as I clear out the flood water, here comes the, the wind. Better yet, let, let, me, let me put it, as, as Joe Madison would say, where the goats can get it. J Joe, just, just when you get one bill paid, up comes another bill. And after you pay that bill, you lose your job. And while you're dealing with the fact that you just lost your job, you get bad news from the doctor's office. And while you're dealing with the report that you just received from the doctor's office, you get your family starts to act up. And while you're dealing with your family, your lights get cut off. You don't have food in the pantry and you don't have enough money to put food in the pantry and to get your lights turned back on. And while you're dealing with that, with the fact of you not having enough money, the friends that you thought you can count on now become fair weather friends and turn their backs on you as if they never knew you. And now it seems that the only song you know how to sing is the fact that life is a three ring circus. But let me encourage someone's heart today by telling you what James says in chapter one of James. James says, count it all joy when you go through various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Beloved, if you want to ensure that you'll be able to stand and with 
withstand the storms of life, make sure that your soul is anchored in the Lord. It's anchored in the Lord. Um, story is told, <laughs> story is told of a woman who was robbed and, and kidnapped <clears throat> and raped. And when her attackers finished with her, they tied her up with duct tape and took her to a remote location and threw her in the dish. I'm just trying to push the point that God is in control. He's in, in control of everything. He's in control of the weather. He's in control of your circumstances. He is in control of it, it, your, it, he's in control of everything. So they took her, they tied her up with duct tape, took her to a remote location and threw her in, in the ditch. When she came to, she opened her eyes and being thankful that she was still alive, determined to trust God through this whole or, ordeal until it starts to rain while she's laying in the ditch. And it now becomes more overwhelming and a bit too much for her to bear. So she, she says out to the Lord, Lord, you let me go through all of this. And now you're just going to let me drown and die out here in this ditch. But as the rain fell, church, hallelujah, the rain water started loosening up the duct tape and she was able to wiggle herself free and make it to safety. And when she came through it all, she said to her family and friends that the Lord sent the rain to set me free. I don't know who I'm talking to in here, but I'm talking to somebody who can look back over your life and say, I would have never made it through whatever it is that you went through if the Lord did not let the rain fall in your life. I'm done, church. But let me just give you one more thing about the inspection of the storm. Not only are storms inevitable, but also storms reveal unto us what we can't see what we can't see. Again, two houses built on two different foundations, one on rock, one on sand. And other than the foundations, the truth of the matter is these houses look very identical. They look similar in size, they look similar in shape, and they look similar in color. And to the naked eye, you couldn't tell the difference between the wise man's house in the foolish man's house. Watch, you couldn't tell the difference until the storm hits. No, let me try it, let me try it another way. From outward appearances, the wise and the foolish man's houses look similar. They both use the same material, they both have the same designs, they both, the both of their houses, the colors was the same, um, let me get to my point. They both go to the same church. I ain't talking about houses no more. I'm talking about people. They both listen to the same sermon. They both pay tithes. They both go to Sunday school. They both go to Bible study. They both go into ministry. They both appear to be good and upright and godly individuals. And the people in the church think that they are righteous people, but one is wise, one is foolish. But how can you tell the difference? Here's how. Wait for the rain to fall. Wait for the wind to blow. Wait for the flood to rise. And based off of the foundation of them both, one will stand while the other will fall. I'm talking to someone who thought that they had a good foundation. Your mama told you, just go to church and you went to church. You became involved in ministry. You wore the right clothes. You learned all the, the church cliches. You know when to lift your hands and to say amen. You do what you think is right in front of people, but you really never submitted your life to Christ and became obedient to his word. And your house keeps falling every time a storm comes in your life because you are building your life on the wrong foundation. And I just want to tell you, but as I'm closing, if you trust in Jesus, he'll be your shelter in the time of storm. If you trust in Jesus, 
He'll be the rock that can't be moved. Amen. The ship was wrecked in the furious storm, and the only survivor was a little boy who was swept up by the waves. And he grabbed hell, held on to a, a rock. He sat there on that rock all night long until he was spotted and rescued the next morning. And someone asked the little boy, little boy, didn't you tremble all night while you was holding on to that rock? And the little boy replied, I trembled all night, but I knew I was safe and secure because the rock I was holding on to, it did not move. And that's what I want to leave you with. When your heart is overwhelmed, and you just feel as though you cannot make it, beloved. Be like David, who said in Psalm 61, hear my cry, O God, listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth, I call to you. When my heart is faint, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Build your life on the word of God as we go into this year of 2020. Don't Build your house on fickle and false things, but allow the word of God to take root into your heart and become obedient to the word that you may grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's prepare for our Lord's Supper. My grandmother would say it like this, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus and what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of Jesus I'm singing oh says, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it 
and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Like man in verse 25 there, it says in the same way, he also took the cup after supper saying, this is the cup, which is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes back again. Brother and sister, we are so grateful for the bread and the wine that demonstrates the Lord's body and blood. We are grateful for the sacrifice that he has made, amen, to bridge the gap and to connect the hands of mankind to the hands of God, amen, that we are now in proper fellowship and have a relationship with God our Father because of Jesus Christ. Let's pray over these ordinances. Oh God, we thank you so much for the sacrifice that you have made. Thank you, God, for blessing us to have a savior that in spite of our sin, God, you look beyond our faults and you saw our chief needs and you provided a savior in, in which God we really don't deserve. But we thank you, God, for his life, his death, his burial and his resurrection. I pray now, God, that as we take this bread and this wine, that we will always remember the sacrifice that you have made through by Jesus Christ. Bless us now and keep us. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. He took the bread. He'd offered it up to his father. Blessed it. Broke it. Passed it amongst his disciples. And said, take, ye and eat. And as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me to show forth my death. Take ye and eat all. Like manna, he took the pitcher and the cup and poured the wine into the cup. And he said, as this blood flows into this cup, this wine flows into this cup. This is how my blood shall be shed for you. Beloved, take ye and drink all. And as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me to show forth my death. Again, we thank God for the blood-stained banner. We thank God for the bloodshed of Jesus Christ. Had it not been for his blood, had it not been for his sacrifice, hell would be our destination. But oh, we thank God that he died on an old rugged cross for our sins. For that alone, beloved, we ought to be rejoicing and thanking God and saying hallelujah and praising God for what he has done. As we on today, may God continue to bless you and keep you. May heaven smile upon you uh, until we meet again. I look forward to worshiping, praying with you on tomorrow, on Monday at noon, on Friday at noon again. We want to continue to pray for all of our sick and shunning. May God bless you. May God keep you. May heaven smile upon you. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us. For more information about our ministry, visit us at www.greaternp.org. May God bless you.